Hi, dear readers of Speak Up. We are here today with a great guest to talk about international politics. His name is Aaron Bastani. He is a journalist at Novara Media. He's also an author. Aaron, thank you so much for being here today. My great pleasure. Okay, so we have asked Aaron to come on because we want to ask him about two new leaders uh, that we have uh, within a European context. Uh, one of them is Liz Truss in the UK with the Conservative Party. The other one is Giorgia Meloni in Italy. Um, and she's from, uh, from Fratelli d'Italia um, and she fundamentally has just won and is creating a lot of commentary internationally. Um, and so basically these two conservative women are regarded in very different ways. And there seem to be sort of two main narratives. One that sees Liz Truss uh, as a regular sort of right winger that sits within a liberal tradition, right? Uh, while it places Giorgia Meloni from uh, Fratelli d'Italia within a fascistic or neo-fascist uh, sphere. And then there's another uh, major view, uh, which kind of says that, you know, ultimately both leaders are just extremely similar neoliberal Thatcherites. And so, Aaron, what are your thoughts on these takes? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, I, I'm obviously better qualified to talk about the situation in the United Kingdom. Um, there are some similarities, but there are also some really big differences, actually. And I think their political trajectories represent two very different parts of the contemporary right. So Liz Truss, as you say, is, is more of an orthodox economic liberal. She has been her whole life. In Britain, the media has kind of focused on the fact she used to be a liberal Democrat. And people say, oh, she's all over the place. She was a liberal Democrat now, she's a conservative. But actually she's been an, been an economic liberal all her life. So when she was at university, she was a member of the Hayek Society. She's always believed in a very small state. She's always believed in wealth creation coming from people at the top rather than workers. Um, and what has changed is obviously that she viewed the Conservative Party that, rather than the Liberal Democrats as the best vehicle for her personal ambitions. But she's always been a Thatcherite, a believer in free markets. And I suppose she's had to adopt a more socially conservative politics just to, to, get, to get by. Georgia Maloney, on the other hand, has that social conservatism sort of at her heart. That is what drives her in politics. Um, and I think Georgia Maloney... In English, we would call her a reactionary. I wouldn't call her a conservative. Um, and that's quite an important term, I think. It's an old term, but I don't think it's an outdated term. I actually think it's more and more relevant now in the 2020s. So what do I mean by a reactionary? And I don't think Liz Truss is a reactionary. Um, a reactionary is somebody who, who has a really critical disposition to the modern world in a number of ways. Um, what modernity means for the family, identity, nation, the individual, God. Um, and often that can, that can have some left-wing inflections and tones. They might criticize consumer capitalism. They might criticize globalization. There are some clips from a Maloney speech you might hear and go, oh, I agree with that. I mean, by the way, mm -hmm. often when they say global finance, they, they mean Jews. That's often what these people mean. It's often an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, but the rhetoric is, is can be seen as, as plausibly overlapping with the left. Trust doesn't do that. So I, I think that's the, that's the important part for me. And, and actually, these two politicians are kind of different parts of the sort of conservative coalition over the last 40 years. It has had those social conservatives, those reactionaries, anti-immigrant rhetoric, et cetera, et cetera. And it's had the people who want free markets, wealth creation from the top and so on. And the magic of the center-right project with Thatcher, with Reagan, uh, with Berlusconi, with a number of other politicians too, is bringing that really big coalition together. And actually they disagree about some pretty big things when you really break it down. And what we're seeing now in the aftermath of the global financial crisis over time 
um, particularly with the Eurozone crisis in the EU, for instance, is that coalition sort of splintering and fracturing. Um, now, in different contexts, and I've gone on a bit here, but I'll finish with this. In different contexts, that means different things. So in Britain, where you have a first-past-the-post system, it's kind of held up anyway, because you people can't leave the Conservative Party to start new parties. So it, it's, it's more or less stayed as that sort of coalition. So you have a free marketeer like Truss having to embrace Brexit, whereas actually she campaigned for a mate. Whereas in Italy, you don't have a first-past-the-post system, you have PR. I know you still have a, a, a right-wing coalition of which Maloney's a part, mm -hmm. but you see more explicitly those differences on the right. But fundamentally, the same process is happening right across Europe. Fundamentally, uh, the other question is, why isn't there, a, you know, reactionary slash populist slash, you know, ultimately just ultra right wing party in the UK, similar to those in continental Europe? Uh, is there maybe, but as outsiders perhaps we don't notice it as much uh what's the what's the difference there there is very little difference between what is happening in britain and france and italy very very little difference liberal commentariat likes to talk sort of essentialize talk about national differences and so on it's complete nonsense there is very little difference it boils down to the electoral system that's all it is so where we had an electoral system which was proportional at like the European elections, we've now got rid of those because we're not a member of the EU anymore. UKIP, UKIP came first in one set of elections. The Brexit party came first in another set of elections, right? That's unthinkable in Westminster elections. It's unthinkable. Now, partly because of the issue of the EU, but also partly because of just proportional representation. And so if we had you know, a system of PR, remember, the whole reason why we had the referendum in the first place is that in 2015, UKIP got 4 million votes. It's a lot of votes. And under a proportional representation system, that would have meant they were in coalition with the Conservative Party. But of course, they weren't in coalition with the Conservative Party because they got no MPs of 4 million votes, which is just incredible. So you can go further back. You can look at the 2009 European elections. Then, a year after the global financial crisis, a party called the British National Party, the BMP, which is a fascist party, explicitly fascist party, there's not, you know, like the MSI, imagine it, Maloney's MSI is running, um, and they got 900,000 votes in 2009. And, and there's been no breakthrough by those parties in a Westminster election because of the electoral system. Now, on the one hand, you might say, that's fantastic. Look, first past the post inoculates Britain from the kinds of politics you see on the, on the radical right. Um, not so fast, because what happened instead was effectively a sort of parasitization, a takeover of the Conservative Party, but by actually quite extreme elements. And I think in a way that's far more unhealthy. I think it's much healthier to have a coalition on the right, which includes somebody like Maloney, and people know what their politics are. And when they fail, they fail on those terms. What you got instead with the Conservative Party was basically it becoming a, 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 you know, a larger version of UKIP, um, having some very strange policies, you know, basically they want to now have boats in the in the English Channel stopping migrants. Um, they want to set up the refugee detention centres in, in, in Rwanda. You've then had the kind of extremist economic policies we've seen over the last week from Liz Truss. And because that's all squished into one party, the electorate and the media have to pretend it's respectable. But, but obviously parts of it really are. So it, it does just boil down to the um, the electoral system. If we had a, if we had a proportional system in this country, you would have a much smaller Conservative Party, and you would have a reasonably significant party to their right, and it would be led by somebody like a Nigel Farage. Um, but we don't have that, so I, I think the exact same dynamics are, are happening, but they're playing out very differently. Finally, in the 2019 local elections, which were at the same time as those European elections I mentioned where the Brexit party came first. The Brexit party was the UKIP party rebranded, basically. Um, in those local elections, what you saw, which was really terrifying in a way, actually, was in local councils, Labour held local councils in the so-called Red Wall, Britain's Rust Belt, if you're looking for a sort of analogy to the US, you saw independence winning, and it would be like the British Veterans Party, 
and they would they would have incredibly right wing politics, Maloney style politics, but it would be confined to five or six councillors in one council here, 10 councillors over here, some independents, it might be a local party, purely local, exclusively local, no Westminster sort of um, affiliation. So, you know, you, you might even argue, actually, I think the fact that we've got first past the post makes it worse because we can't really understand the scale of the problem. Whereas at least in Italy, you know, people's politics, the cards are on the table and you can you can work from there. Here, here it's a bit more mystified. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's important to, you know, uh, be aware of this uh, difference slash non-difference because ultimately uh, systems differ so much that it's great that, you know, you laid out uh, how we have to pay attention to that before we kind of come to conclusions about differences that aren't really there all that much. Um, there are also those who celebrate the fact that these two politicians are women. Uh, what is your opinion on their potential impact on the conditions of Italian and British women? Yeah, the Maloney one is particularly funny, I suppose, because, you know, at least with Liz Truss, we've got we've got a precedent, which is Thatcher, which is a quite, quite a right wing politician. She didn't really do much to advance the cause of sort of gender equality. But then the counter argument is, well, a woman was in the top job. I mean, that 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 probably is a good thing. Whereas I think with Maloney, like it's just so pernicious because you saw the quote from sort of Hillary Clinton saying this is wonderful, you know we've got a, f a female a potential female prime minister in, in in italy and i mean it's dangerous i mean it shows the limits of liberal feminism doesn't it to, to, to quite a strong extent there's that great meme where you have these two people being bombed in like afghanistan and they're looking up and there's a drone and uh the woman says i hear the next person in charge of all this is going to be a woman and the guy says isn't it wonderful to be part of history and the point is, if you've got drone programs like murdering civilians in the global south, it doesn't really matter if a man or a woman is at the top issuing the sort of presidential decrees. Um, and so I hope, actually, we can finally have a really sensible conversation about you know, liberal feminism, liberal anti-racism and, and the limits of those things. And actually, they go hand in hand because Liz Truss is not alone here. It's not like with Thatcher, with, with Thatcher in 79. Um, in when it was just Margaret Thatcher and then everybody beneath her was still a white man. What you have with Truss actually is a really identitarian conservative party. So the Chancellor of the Exchequer is black. It's the first ever black Chancellor of the Exchequer. You've got a Home Secretary who's from South, she's got South Asian heritage, she, she's brown. Um, you've got senior people in the, in the cabinet, Kemi Badenoch, who's black. <clears throat> so yeah, this is gonna be a really, in a way, perhaps useful test of, of the limits of liberal feminism and liberal anti-racism. Maloney is a bit different huh? because Maloney is a bit more similar to Thatcher in so much as the political operation around her is still very much, they're not identitarian, you know, it's not like her second in command is a brown woman and then her third in command is somebody, you know, you know, bisexual or something like this. Whereas the, the, the Conservative Party, when it comes to identity politics, are actually far more advanced than the Labour Party. You know, the senior people at the top of the Labour Party are all white now, which is not good either. Um, but it's interesting, you know, the, the, the Tories obviously are, are acting in the best interest generally of, of incredibly wealthy people. And finally, what it does do is it, I hope in Britain, it allows us to have a conversation about race and class, right? So this racial analysis without a class one is, is kind of stupid because look, the Chancellor is black and so what? The average person of African heritage in the UK is less likely to own a home, more likely to end up in prison, less likely to have university education, earning less money. Those are the things that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so what do you believe will be these leaders attitude towards inequality? Um, and which effects might it have? Will the impact be felt internationally? Well, it's, we're talking at an interesting time, so I'm, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about the dates, but we're, we're talking basically the day after Liz Truss almost collapsed the British pension funds market. Um, th these are really, really strange 
times. So, you know, what, what it seems to have happened, and bear in mind, she's only started this month. She started the job, I think, on the 3rd of September. Um, she has, within less than a month, seemingly catalyzed the global financial crisis, but just for Britain, um, because obviously inflation was high. We've had a, a predict, we've got a predicted recession. Interest rates were already going up. And what they decided to do was cut taxes um, on the wealthy in particular. And what that has done is that scared um, currency markets and people who buy British debt because they think increasingly Britain won't be able to service its debt payments. Um, and so they were not buying British gilts. And so something British gilts is sovereign debt, it's like US treasuries. So because the interest rate that people were getting, this is, I'm going to make this as simple as, as possible, really. People had British debt over the last 10 years, which had been bought with very low interest rates, which meant their return was very low. But all of a sudden, when you've got British interest rates now predicted to go to 7 8%, that debt now being issued is going to be far more valuable. And so the debt you have, which is less valuable, why would you want to keep it? It's going to become less valuable, right? So you want to get rid of it. So what happened was, was a big sell-off of British debt. And of course, when you do that, you get the currency devaluing because less people want to buy the debt. And that's kind of precipitated this incredibly unforeseen and unnecessary economic crisis. So in terms of long term, I really have no idea. Um, it may be that she doesn't survive till Christmas. It may be that, you know, the Bank of England does loads of interventions, as they've done before, right? The ECB's done before, um, and they calm markets, and she sticks around. But um, it is, it's really an exercise in ideologically driven politics. And I like ideology. You know, I'm on the left. I'm social. I like ideology. It's good. You need ideology in politics. But she, you know, it's a bit like the equivalent would be you know, we're having a the cost of living crisis, runaway inflation, zero growth. And then Jeremy Corbyn says we're going to have capital controls. Uh, we're going to bring everything into public ownership. You know, we're going to have this, you know, very top down approach to the economy completely overnight. People would get very terrified. I think on the left, we have good, important conversations about strategy, about how, precisely how to avoid that. Right. How would you enact a socialist program without, I mean, OK, currency traders can get scared. Who cares? Not to this extent, right? Not to the extent that the entire thing collapses. Um, Mitterrand had the same issue. With Mitterrand in France in the 80s, it took several months. With Liz Truss, it's taken 72 hours. So it, it really shows to me um, the extent to which people like her believe this ideology and the extent to which they're detached from actual quote unquote political pragmatism, which is always laid at the feet of the left, but actually it's people like her who are far worse. Yeah, so uh, that was incredibly insightful. Um, and yeah, it's, it's great to, you know, compare both countries and really get an idea um, of, you know, what scenario might show up um, in, the, in the coming months. Uh, so yeah, Aaron, thank you so much. Those were our questions and we hope... Um, that our readers enjoyed them and learned a lot, uh, both language-wise <laughs> and also uh, politically and, you know, in terms of international relations. Thank you. It was a real pleasure to talk to you. <laughs>